Pray with me, please. Father, God, through your Son being revealed to us, may we understand more about you. May we understand more about ourselves. As we read scripture, as we contemplate scripture, give us, give us a vision of you. The story for today that we're looking at is in Luke chapter 4. If you need to find Luke in the Bible, it's, it's half the Bible, and then that last half, you half again, and you'll end up in the gospel someplace. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then the fourth chapter. Starting in verse 14, Luke 4, 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did in Capernaum, Do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their myths, He went away. There's some context that needs to be said for this story. It's a little intense. It's a little out of the ordinary. Um, First, we look back a few chapters and we see that Jesus had just been baptized by John the Baptist. We know that in the story. And and just before this story, in in chapter 3, or in the beginning of chapter 4, we see that Jesus was then, after Jesus had been baptized and the Holy Spirit came down and rested upon him and proclaimed that this was was, uh, God's Son in whom he was well pleased, then the Spirit led Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan for over a month. And after that, then he comes to his hometown, as though all of that wasn't difficult enough. And so Jesus comes back to this place. He comes into the synagogue, which was his habit, the Bible explains. This was what he did on a regular basis. He would go on Sabbath into the synagogue. Now, synagogues, we, uh, synagogues are still used today by, the, by uh, the Jewish people. And synagogues started, they historians and and, uh, theologians suspect that it started about the time of the exile when God's people were no longer in Israel that the temple was destroyed and they were pushed out way into all sorts of lands especially into into Babylon and in this in this foreign um, very strange very very pagan and and 
uh, different culture, the, the, the Jews, the, the people of God needed to, to be together in a way that was meaningful, a way that would, uh, that would remind them of their identity, remind them about who they were, as instead of becoming acclimated uh, to the cult surrounding culture, that they, they, they stayed true to who they were, uh, remember, learning the stories of their, of their uh, family, of their history. Um, and, and theologians and historians suspect that, that if synagogues had not started up, the Jewish people as a people would have just, just disintegrated into the surrounding cultures if synagogues had not been established. Because the temple was their identity. Their ability to come into the very presence of God was, was who, what made them who they were. And with that demolished, their identity was just smashed. But synagogues brought them back together. It's much like a church because it was a place for worship. It was a place for, for uh, being together. And this is, a, this is essential even in our church. And, and we today, just as in those days, we do not forsake the meeting together of ourselves. We want to stay together. We want to be together in this space to so re-anchor re, um, uh, re ourselves together in the identity of Jesus. So if you see in verse 14, it says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went throughout all the surrounding country, and he taught in the synagogues by being glorified by all, because Jesus knew how to tell a story. He knew how to ex explain proverbs and psalms and prophecies, and he brought new life, new life to these texts that had been dead for so long. And he, then he comes to his hometown in Nazareth, where he was brought up. Everybody knew him. Everybody knew him since he was a little kid. I changed your diaper kind of, kind of knew him. And he went up into the synagogue, now a man of 30. He comes into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Imagine that scene. What was it like even before people were in synagogue? Imagine, imagine Mary had, had still be living in that town, had walking up to the synagogue that morning, beaming her son is going to be in, in synagogue with her today. And she's just so happy that, he, that he's there with her. And, and uh, as she's walking, I imagine uh, some ladies walking up beside her and, and, and just saying, oh, Mary, I heard that your son is, is visiting. So he'll probably be preaching today, right? Uh, I heard that he's preaching in, in a lot of other towns. Uh, he's made quite the circuit, you know? And, Okay, and then another woman comes up and she says, oh, oh, someone told me that your son, Jesus, he's been teaching in places. Where, where did he pick that up? Where did he get that from? It, it couldn't have been his, his father. And then, Mar oh, Mary, I, I, I didn't know that Jesus um, was in town. You know, I, I'm a little, little worried, you know, he didn't get to go to school with, with that my, the, the school that my two sons went to, you know, um, because, you know, he was busy helping his uh, your husband were in the shop. So, you know, uh, he didn't get to go to school. Is he going to is he going to actually read something up front or is he just going to uh, maybe he can just recite something from memory, something he learned as a child. You know, I think that would be fine. It would be fine if he did that. He was such a quiet boy. He was always out in nature, you know, very strange, but very kind, very nice kid, nice kid. Um, and then somebody else says, Mary, I heard that your son's preaching today. I'm so excited. I've heard a report that he's gotten so much better at telling stories. Runs in your family, doesn't. How are you doing, by the way? Everything okay with you? And so he comes in, they come into the synagogue, they fill up the pews, people sitting in their, in their respective places where they're supposed to sit. And they come in, and, and Jesus, he comes in looking dashing. Because, you know, his mother would, as soon as he got home, she, she already had prepared, laid out what she wanted him to wear, make the family proud. And, and so she already had that, and he probably came in with, with this, mom, mom, woman, you know. And so he's, he comes in with this, this nice outfit, and he walks up to the front, just like he did when he was a little boy. 
And the, the attendant, he brings him the scroll, and Jesus, he, he's up there, and he rolls it out, and everyone's thinking, wow, he's changed. It's been a little while. And, and he, he, his beard looks fuller or something. I can't, I can't tell. He lost some weight. I don't know what happened. And so he unrolls the scroll, and these things are going to people's mind. And he turns in the scroll to a place that, that we know in Isaiah, as uh, it was later designated as cha uh, chapter 61, Isaiah 61, and he begins reading. And he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives he is, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolls up the scroll. He gives it back to the attendant. He essentially drops the mic and then he sits down. And all eyes were fixed on him. And you could hear these... Amen, amen, all throughout the congregation, the, the beginning of applause, oh, we don't do that here, and so they stop, and, and they say, oh, wow, he's so cute, he preaches so well, he read that so well, how did he learn to do that, he sounded so professional, just like a real rabbi, wow, was, uh, was that his prophet impersonation, you know, I, I wish he had pounded his fists a few more times, that would have been a good effect. You know, something like that. Mmm, inspiring. And yet everyone still sat there, just nodding and applauding, but they had no intention of, of, of doing what he was just talking about. They, they just continued in the, sitting in their pews, enjoying the show. And then Jesus, verse 21, and then Jesus says, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Hmm? What? Well, no, he didn't. And they spoke well of him at this gracious words, and, were, and then they said, but then isn't this the Joseph's son? And somebody says, oh, he's being so sweet. He's being so professional. And someone says, no, no, no. He's being metaphorical. And another person says, no, he's being, he's being literal. Don't you see? And then someone says, he's being heretical. Another person, he's being insulting. Poor? Poor? Proclaim good to the poor? It's, it's being fulfilled right. No, hold on. Poor? No, no, no. Uh, we're not poor. I know how he grew up. He grew up dirt poor. His father was a carpenter. His father, Joseph's son, was a carpenter. He, he, he was a fix-it man. Everything's made of wood. They, he just does the odd jobs that he can find. He couldn't even earn a living here. He had to commute. Like, captive? No, hold on. We're not captive to anyone. We're not the slaves of anyone. We're free. What, what do you mean, to us, preach good news? To us, we don't need that kind of good news. Blind, I can see just fine, thank you. I understand where I stand. Oppressed, oppress nothing. And in verse 23, and he said to them, and he, as, he, as Jesus is sitting in that space, he's, he's reading the thoughts of people. I don't think it was like a, a telepathic person type of reading his thoughts. I think he, he could just, he knew people so well. He knew how, what was going on inside of human hearts that had been so, so steeped in sin for so long. And he, he, said, he said, doubtless, you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. But, you know, there was a time when Elijah, a prophet of God, he left here, he left this space left this country to go where God wanted him to go, a widow, not a rich person, not someone who of, of esteems a widow in a foreign country, in an enemy territory of Israel. And he sent the prophet to her. And then Elisha, he could have healed so many lepers in, that, in Israel, but instead, who does he heal? Who is the story about? He heals Naaman, a Syrian, an enemy of God's people. God is going to pass 
all y'all up and go to the people that will seek him. And as Jesus proclaimed that his ministry, that his work was for those that would accept him, the ones that would be humble, that, would, that realized that they are poor, that they are captive, that they are blind, that they are oppressed, by so many things in their lives that this ever-widening ministry of Jesus would continue. When they saw this, they wanted him to stop preaching. Imagine if you were his, one of his sisters or one of his brothers um, that were sitting in that congregation that day. And as he's preaching, you kind of whisper to the person next to you, oh no, he, he, here he goes. You know, he, he does this sort of thing now and then. You know, he, he's such a pure-hearted guy. You know, he doesn't realize how the world really works. No, 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 no. He, he, he doesn't really mean it. He just, he's just, he's been out for a while. He's sick. Something's wrong. How would you feel if you were one of those people? How would you feel if you were, if you were his, his, his uh, brother or sister? How would you feel if you, if you were one of his disciples? It's interesting that his disciples weren't mentioned in this story at all at this point. They, they must have left at some point in this story just before he's, he's about to be killed. It's, it's this weird foreshadowing that happens in, the, in this story. Jesus calls them poor, and they say, physician, heal yourself. That's kind of like saying, you know what? Take to yourself. Deal with it yourself. Like, look at yourself. You're the one that's poor. Fix yourself up before you start coming over to me. I know how you grew up. Look at you. Prove that you can do something before I'll, I'll listen to you. They rejected this idea because their, heart, their hearts were hard, then they would, they would rather continue passing up the outsider instead of accept them. That this was so contrary, this, this gospel that would go to everyone was so contrary to who they were as, as, as individuals that, they, that every, every bit of hatred uh, came up inside of them. They didn't want to hear anymore because then they'd have to recognize that they were no better than the heathen that they hated so much. That God would go to them and pass them up. He always, uh, they would think things like, he always thought that he was better than us. Not joining in in anything we did. He was always out in the field, in the forest. He thinks he's so holy, so righteous. I'll show him righteous. So the, in those days, I wonder if it was different. In those days, their, their Sabbaths were these, these calculated hours of time to conformity and formalism. And when Jesus said this is a time for healing, for acceptance, for wholeness, verse 28, when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of this hill so they could throw him off the cliff. Um, it's pretty surprising, right? That a, a, a church would do that to someone. Would try and throw him off a cliff instead of listen to what they have to say. There's an illustration that I realize kind of demonstrate this a little better. That if you're on a if you're on a ship, if you're a sailor on a ship, and, and you don't like the captain, you really don't like the captain. It's really too bad because you're kind of stuck with him, right? You're out on this ship, out in the middle of the ocean, no land in sight, and you just can't stand your captain. So what do you do first? Uh, you know, the captain, he really doesn't know what he's doing, really doesn't know where he's going. You breathe dissension, share little comments. Oh, hello, sir. Oh, thank you very much. I don't like that guy. Never did. You don't like him either? Yeah. What don't you like about him? Oh, yeah, me too. Uh, then after a while, then you say, you know, maybe we should talk to the captain. Let's talk to the captain. Ah, he's so stubborn-headed, he wouldn't listen anyway. He starts breathing. What if we do? Let, let's just get off this ship. No, no, I don't want to be stuck on an island. Let's get him off this ship. 
No, you know what? Don't just want to mutiny by, by kicking the captain out. I want to kill him. I want him gone forever. The ultimate end of rebellion is the death of the person in charge. A, 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 a complete rebellion of creations will eventually end in their murder of their creator or their desire to. There is, there is nothing, if it is complete, if it is a complete rebellion, it will be to the point of, of getting rid of at all costs the one that is, is in conflict with the way they want to live their lives. And this, this church, this congregation, this synagogue, at that time, had this, this perfect example of God before them, and they couldn't stand it. So much so that they wanted to get rid of him. And this was just the beginning of his ministry. And so as they, as they rose up to get rid of this, this man that was, that was bringing to light everything about themselves, every, every bit of hatred and, and, and uh, uh, little petty things that they just love to do, the, the, the good sins, uh, they, 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 as all these things cropped up, they said, we got to get rid of him and this wrath. They overwhelmed them. They were filled with wrath and they rose up. They grabbed Jesus and they brought him out of the town. It's interesting that it, it took Jesus to get them angry to actually get them out of their church, right? And they, they said, we brought you up in this world. We'll cast you out of it. And they're, they're bringing him. But it wasn't his time yet. And the Bible simply says that they were going to throw him off the cliff, verse 30, but passing through their midst, he went away, untouched. This foreshadowing of what was to come, it was already to its uh, peak in that place. So when you follow Jesus, your life will not be any different. If they treated your Lord, your Savior, your God that way, how why do we expect people to treat you any different? How do you, you will lose everything you ever knew in order to follow the one who lost everything in order to find you and to bring you to him. What is the point of relatability to this story? I really hope that it's not to the murderous crowd. We are here not to, not to kill Jesus, but to worship him, to understand him more. This is, however, a situation that was given to us to see ourselves in. They didn't wake up that morning thinking, happy Sabbath, I feel like throwing the speaker off a cliff. Please don't think that. But you know, throwing someone's reputation off a cliff Gossip doesn't have to be false to be gossip. Spreading true things about someone is still gossip. Mary, so your, 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 uh, 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 your husband, right? Oh, it, it was a carpenter, right? Well, think about what do I, uh, if you think, well, if, if, if gossip is telling something true about someone also, not just the false things, well, then what am I going to talk about you can talk about yourself, but then you think, I don't want people talking about me and my business, no one else's business. Gossiping is just as evil as murder or adultery, something heinous like that. Yet, yet um, because information is, is uh, of a personal nature is shared, and it's shared without responsibility, um, it's like, it's like uh, eating without thanking the cook or even paying the bill. It's like uh, uh, coughing without covering your mouth. Yeah, excuse me, you know, just spreading, spreading your germs all around. And gossip is just like um, one of those many other sins that breeds in a community that is tight but not tight-lipped. 
It, it's a breed of nice sins that we can get away with. And just like pride is another one that can actually be fed in a community, and especially in a religious community. That pride is actually a, is mingled with piety. That a relationship with God kind of, kind of gives you that right to talk about somebody else or to, or to kind of realize, oh, they're a little bit beneath me at this point in their life. Another, one of those nice sins is lethargy. To be physically and emotionally just blah. Immov immovable, complacent, callous. Not hot, not cold, just room temperature. All talk, no action. All bulk, but no actual lifting power. So instead, what do we do? What, what kind of, what kind of uh, space will this be? This is a church, this is a community where all those nice sins can breed so, so easily. We need to support each other. We need, to, we need to mind our thoughts that we think towards each other as we walk into here every, every Sabbath. How do we think about ourselves? Do we think about ourselves as, as poor? Are we, are we rich? Do we feel like we're rich? Or do we feel like we're poor when we walk in here? How do we dress? How do we walk in? Where do we park? In the front, where everyone sees a nice car, or in the back because we feel ashamed? Do we feel captive, or do we feel free? I'm, I'm here because this makes me feel good. Or am I here because I need God? I need this time of my faith to be built up. Do I feel blind? I know there's things in my life that I, I, I can't put my finger on, but I need help to see them. Or do we see... <laughs> I'm good. Do we feel oppressed or do we feel unburdened? Only in Jesus can we be free. Only in, in Jesus can we truly see ourselves. Sitting in these pews, as we all are right now, think about how did I, how did I come in here? How did I come into this space? And now think, how will you leave with Jesus? Will he be under arm or in your fist? 